Namaste, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us on this Tuesday edition of The Right Stand. There were 90,000 soldiers who folded in front of the might of the Indian Army. Those that engineered a split in Bharat in 1947 found themselves sliced less than 25 years later. As these POWs went back home, they were mocked and scoffed at. Such was the humiliation that many never wore the uniform again. Those that did could never forget the insult. This pain, this insult is what drives the Pakistan deep state, its military establishment and its agenda to bleed India with a thousand cuts. No matter what they do, that humiliation of 1971 haunts. The ghosts of those Pakistani generals of the past continue to echo that humiliation into the current line of generals who run the Pak establishment. Point is, barring a few wins here and there, Enmity with Bharat has been a loss-making proposition for Pakistan, especially its military and deep state. They, like leeches, sucked American dollars for more than three decades. And now when Uncle Sam has existed, Afghanistan, this blinded by hate and still hurting cause of the 1971 insult lot, is firmly in the lap of the CCP and the PLA. Such is the ISI and Pak deep state's obsession with Bharat that they are on the verge of pawning away their sovereignty and it is this desperation that is making them cling to the only narrative that is available and that for them they believe works. It is the last straw that they cling on to, the Kashmir narrative. And tonight, straight from the horse's mouth, we bring you details of Pakistan's renewed Mission Kashmir blueprint in this Right Stand and CNN News 18 exclusive. So the ISI has further and once again reactivated Mission Kashmir. Why now? Because there is a fresh offensive amid the spring of setbacks or string of setbacks. Pre-2008, the ISI operated 80 plus missions in Kashmir and other parts of India. The military very low on funds currently due to A, the sinking economy, B, the FATF blacklist looming and money becoming a huge crunch. Of course, the American dollars drying up, Pakistan losing grip even in Balochistan and also Afghanistan, which they claimed a huge victory, but now it's bleeding them, it's hurting them. ISI for Tehrike Taliban operations in Kashmir, but Tehrike Taliban Pakistan is unwilling. They don't want to get into Indian soil. Also, Pakistan's new Kashmir blueprint says ISI is creating new terror nexus via the Islamic State of Vilaya Hind. So the Vilaya Hind, ISHP is what they are calling it. And in this, they are now trying to give, Vilaya Hind has been given a list of targets in Jammu and Kashmir, this grouping. This grouping is what? It's just a clubbing of the Hezbollah, the Jaish, the Lashkar Kader and put them all together and bunch them up rather than having different wings of Hydra just create one big lump. Now, properties of Jammu and Kashmir, terrorists being sold to raise funds and this is happening in interior. So, Sopor, Kupwara, some of the other regions where in the villages they are selling off whatever properties they have to liquidate to create to catch funds. That's what the ISI is telling them. Training of JNK youth to try and fight the Indian forces. So, this is something which they are trying to reactivate but more importantly, China is keen on operations in Afghanistan and JNK to try and engage India on two fronts. So this is a question that rig, uh, rings right loud clear. Is the ISI right now being dictated by China? Let's go across to Sushant Sareen, senior fellow ORF, joining us, a strategic affairs expert and Major General Dhruv Katoch also joining us. Now, these details, Sushant Sareen, as I say, good namaste and good evening to the two of you gentlemen. Sushant, these details that we have accessed is from a retired ISI officer. A retired ISI officer has told our investigations editor Manoj Gupta these details. Now, obviously, we have seen a lot of this play out in the last two, three years since the abrogation of uh, Article 370. But clearly, there seems to be a desperation. And this somewhere, do you agree if I were to say, is the last straw. They're clutching onto this straw. Ye bhi gaya to khatam. 
Anand, uh, I won't uh, say the last straw just yet because I've been hearing this that terrorism sponsored by Pakistan has its back broken. It's on its last legs. It's the last desperate lunge of these terrorists. Uh, and we've seen it continue for decades. So I won't uh, go to the extent you are going. But yes, uh, it is very visible that uh, they are on the back foot, uh, partly because of the very robust Indian uh, security grid in Jammu and Kashmir and other parts of India, uh, partly because of their own bankruptcy and their own problems, and partly because of uh, what you can call the uh, the uh, the uh, blowback of terrorism inside mm -hmm. Pakistan. So I think it's a combination of factors uh, which has kind of uh, forced them to backtrack a bit. Uh, on the China-Pakistan equation, I think that nexus is extremely well established. I don't think there's any doubt about it. In fact, uh, somebody who's often appeared on your shows, uh, David Devdas, who's one of our Kashmir experts, mm. has been warning for more than 10 years now that the Chinese and the Pakistanis are acting in conjunction as far as Jammu and Kashmir is concerned. So uh, again, this particular revelation in your report hmm. does not come as a surprise. I don't think uh, the Chinese are giving instructions to the Pakistanis. I suspect that they are both working in collaboration hmm. uh, to destabilize India in whichever way they can to pressurize India. Hmm. Uh, some of the other revelations are also interesting. They kind of uh, are borne out by what we hear from yes. other sources. For example, the Islamic State Hind province. Hmm. Now, what has happened is that the Islamic State uh, Khorasan has been limited to Afghanistan and to uh, parts of the tribal belt and the Pashtun belt of Pakistan. Hmm. Then they have formed an Islamic State Pakistan province. And then there is something called the Islamic State Hind province. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's one, again, another uh, uh, outlet, which is the Kashmir province kind of a Correct. thing. But it's basically the Hind province, which is uh, much more worrisome right now. Uh, but there are reasons to believe that uh, the Islamic State is essentially an ISI-sponsored, uh, you know, organization. Uh, it has very close links uh, with the Haqqani network, who is also part of the Taliban. Hmm. But, you know, the Pakistanis are notorious for keeping uh, some aces up their sleeve. Hmm. So even while they were supporting the Taliban, uh, there were very credible reports uh, that the Pakistanis were also deeply uh, in bed with the Islamic State uh, mm. terrorists in Afghanistan. Because this was going to be their leverage point. And right. the moment you see the Taliban take a somewhat stronger stand against Pakistan bullying, you suddenly see a spike in the attacks by the uh, Islamic State fellows in, inside Afghanistan. Right. So I think that's a game the Pakistanis have been playing. So this Islamic State Hind province gives the Pakistanis a plausible deniability and yet you know keeps the fires of terrorism alive so mm. again this kind of adds up what does not really add up for me is this bit about uh, the nexus between the lashkar e taiba and the jaish e mohammed and the others mm. uh, i would be a little skeptical on that partly because the Lashkar is not exactly a favorite group of the Taliban or of the Tehrik e Taliban. Right. I know one thing for a fact, uh, Anand, and again you'll find this interesting. The Pakistanis have been trying to reach out to the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan even earlier, many, many mm. years earlier, to try and divide them between the Punjabi Taliban and the Pashtun Taliban. Right. And the Punjabi Taliban, they have been trying to direct to Kashmir. Uh, that included a bulk of the Diobandi fellows uh, who were also attached to the Harkatul Mujahideen, to jaish e mohammed and some of these other groups. Hmm. So, and we've seen a spike in attacks by these fellows uh, in Kashmir. Correct. The Lashkar attacks have somewhat gone down. The Jaish attacks have been, the Jaish has been far more active. Hmm. So again, that bit adds up. What does not add up is the Lashkar getting into a bed with the Taliban, the tehrik -e taliban and all of that. Because the tehrik -e taliban and the Lashkar have had, uh, actually have had uh, shooting matches between them. And right. uh, while the Pakistanis tried to insert the lashkar e taiba in areas where the TTP was uh, had influence and had sway, uh, the TTP fought back and uh, virtually eliminated the lashkar e taiba from there. So right. I don't think uh, there's any love lost between these two guys but right. other things in the report are pretty interesting 
Well, but here what happens is the TTP is still not on board. They are wanting to get them on board that they are not on board and uh, there is a, perhaps a certain level of resistance is what the ISI officer has said. But General Katoj, the, the other aspect is the American dollars have dried up. So they don't have money. Now, this is this a, perhaps a Chinese suggestion that you start combining ranks, pooling in resources rather than maintaining multiple hydra? The other aspect is that how deeply embedded are the PLA into the Pakistani system now? that they are now calling the shots and dictating terms to the ISI. And the Chinese model, model is different. China will not throw money to them at the Pakistanis. They will exact their pound of flesh, if not more. Uh, Anand, actually, uh, whatever Sushanta said, uh, mm. I'm practically in agreement with what he has said. I would just like to make a few additional points. Mm. You know, the, firstly, uh, you spoke about the Chinese. Mm. Now, I don't think the Chinese are going to... Uh, um, uh, you know, tell the Pakistanis how to operate. Hmm. Uh, you know, they won't be, I, they will neither be coordinating the operations, nor will they be taking part in any of those activities. Hmm. Uh, um, at the best, I think what the Chinese are really trying to do is to fight India using the Pakistanis. So hmm. basically, they're using those groups to fight, uh, to, to what do you call it, uh, destabilize India hmm. to the best of their ability. But they are not going to get involved in the fighting. Uh, at the maximum, they may do some funding. Or, or stuff like that hmm. uh, but even that is drying up so the chinese direct interference in this particular part of the area uh, i would put a real question mark hmm. uh, I, I would put greater activity of the chinese actually in india's northeast uh, where where uh, perhaps through myanmar uh, they may try to carry out these stabilization uh, these stabilizing activities this is one hmm. Uh, the second point is, as far as the TTP is concerned, it is mm. my view that the TTP basically is fighting against the Pakistani state, mm. which means they are really fighting against the, for them, the enemy is the Pakistan military, the Pakistan army to be specific. Right. So for them to get embroiled in Jammu and Kashmir or, to, or other places is a secondary battle for them. They may like to do that once they have finished their initial battle right. uh, within Pakistan to create uh, an Islamic state within Pakistan. That is what the TTP aims to do. Hmm. Uh, it is very far from achieving their aims, but uh, they will continue to fight the Pakistan military um, and not concentrate their forces as far as India is concerned. Hmm. Thirdly, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, you know, um, I, I think it makes some sense for them to really um, utilize the lim limited resources which they have got uh, in um, consolidating their forces in terms of the Lashkar and the Hezbollah, etc., etc., for the time being. But the biggest hit which they have got really is not, uh, of course, the military, the Indian army has been very active along with the other security forces. I think the biggest hit they got was in the, uh, on 5th August 2019, uh, when 370, 370 became history, hmm. when Article 370 became history. Now, what really happened at that point of time was that there was a very strong nexus which, which existed between uh, the ISI and their own handlers within Pakistan with the uh, political leadership uh, elements within in, within Jammu and Kashmir, right. especially through the Huriyat. Now, those linkages started getting uh, started getting broken with the uh, abrogation of 370. And along with that, what happened was that internally within Kashmir, those linkages also started getting weakened between the terrorist groupings and their over, overground supporters. Now, I think this has been really the biggest game changer which has happened because without 370 going, there was no hope of ever uh, establishing peace in this region. Right. Even the mainstream political parties like the uh, like uh, the Abdullahs mm. and uh, um, the Muftis, even they are soft separators. And when the wind will, if the wind uh, if the wind blows in a different direction, they will follow that direction. Correct. So it is very important for 370 to go. And with that having gone, I think the changes which we are seeing in JNK uh, now is mm. basically a direct result of that uh, of that initiative. Hmm. And now we need to consolidate on that point. Of course, the security forces will also have to keep uh, uh, keep a very strong focus on anti-terrorist operations. Hmm. And the center will have to keep a very strong focus on the uh, fundings. Right. Because yeah. uh, the funding is really coming from a combination of drugs and smuggling and uh, other issues. Uh, so Pakistan is not, uh, they don't require too much funds to continue with the uh, terrorism within JNK. Hmm. So, uh, uh, I think that is one thing which we still need to be careful about. But I am very hopeful. In my view, I think we are looking at the end game. And this end game will play out within a year or two years. And after that, it will be very difficult for Pakistan to revive the movement. Well, as long Anand. as long as we continue to be in a place or in a, in a way try to exercise severe amount of economic hardship 
uh, of, of over Pakistan, as they say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know that the cost of blood or cost of every bullet should become dearer for them there, for them to try and do any activity in our country. So that cost of trying to wage a proxy war, we have to make it so far, so prohibitive that Pakistan will have to look away and have to give up on this. But somewhere, I just, uh, so one, one gets the inkling that this obsession comes stems from that humiliation. And that, and that humiliation is something which they've never been able to shirk off. And they're always constantly reminded of it. All this hate, all the vitriol, all the venom, all the propaganda using, uh, you know, religion as the opiate, perhaps stems from that particular uh, insult in 1971. It also stemmed before that, and that's why we, this nation was partitioned. But I'm just saying post-partition, that, that perhaps is the trigger. General Katoj and Sushant Sarin, thank you very much for joining us on this exclusive news break here on The Right Stand. I have to move on, ladies and gentlemen. Plenty of ground to cover. We've got to go across to UK, what's happening with Rishi Sunak. Are we going to have something which is history in the United Kingdom? We'll talk about that. But first, debate number one tonight on The Right Stand, and that is Closer Home in Bihar, which adds another leaf to the PFI files. PFI, an organization that traces its roots to Simi, an organization that claims to be Muslim mirror image of the RSS. That's what the PFI wants to portray themselves as. And which claims to be a socio-political organization. But in reality has been involved in multiple events of social unrest, violence, murder, vandalism and most importantly been accused of harboring a pan-Islamist agenda. Until recently, they were nefarious for their activities largely in Kerala and Karnataka, but now they are under the scanner of the NIA for a pan-India disturbance. Starting with the CAA protest, from there they started to manifest pan-India and every other instance they have somewhere or the other, 8 out of 10, if not 9 on 10 or 10 on 10, there has been an involvement of PFI and, it, and its affiliate organizations, be it Campus Front, be it the SDPI or others. Now, the latest entry in the PFI files comes from Bihar, where cops claim that a terror module has been busted that harbored the intent to work towards changing India into an Islamic state in 2047. Now, this is the copy of the document that the cops have recovered. The cops claim they have recovered this document which was in possession with the three accused. Now, we've gone through this document, the pan-Islamist agenda in 2047. Tonight, another aspect of this pan-Islamist design has been unearthed. One that indicates that the intent to fuel further violence and extremism. So let's get in and do a deep dive. Some of the aspects which have come as per the interrogation of one of the accused, Athar Parvez, by the Bihar police and also what we have been able to understand from the enforcement directorate. Athar Parvez and Arman Malik may have made some shocking revelations, ladies and gentlemen. The revelations are that over 15,000 Muslim youth across Bihar have been trained to operate weapons. Unemployed, illiterate youth have been largely targeted and to a certain extent brainwashed. The PFI has camp offices in 15 districts in Bihar. Purnia is the PFI headquarters in Bihar. Now there is more information. As the Enforcement Directorate has taken over the entire cases of funding because there were nearly 83 lakh rupees that were found in the accounts of Atar Parvez, Arwan Malik and Jalaluddin. Jalaluddin is actually a former sub-inspector. PFI is dealing in cash since the Enforcement Directorate raids post the anti-CAA protest. That's when they saw how so much money was coming in. Nearly 120 crores came in and the questions were asked. And they said, what of our money is being dealt as far as cash is concerned, small amounts, so which can be actually shown as zakat or donation receipts. So rupees 5 to about 1,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees, that has been shown as zakat. So that's how they're trying to break down the money flow. So misusing the concept of donation for charity. Receipts shown as zakat to prove crowdfunding. That's what they are trying to say, that this is all people are sending us money for the organization to function, so that's what we are using. The Hawala route is also being examined. Also under the scanner, ladies and gentlemen, is whether or not this money has come from PFI's Kerala, Karnataka wings and been rooted into Bihar. So this module has also busted one more angle. And this angle is the Nupur Sharma angle. Interestingly, Nupur Sharma's address and phone number has been found in the accused Athar's phone. Now when confronted, Athar has said that someone actually forwarded it to him. If you were to take what he has said, 
at face value then the question remains who forwarded and how many people has this her has her number and uh, address been forwarded to the other aspect is if he is lying then what was his intent why did he have that number and name phones being tested forensically as we speak over this now the question is is there a specific target or intention to target nupur sharma is a question that we are asking even as the supreme court today has given her some relief against any coercive action till the 10th of august when the hearing is posted next arti agarwal abhishek banerji and tausif ahmed khan joining us this evening namaste let me start with arti agarwal the details are quite startling how organized are they and how many people in bihar right now have been pushed with an agenda of not social upliftment but radicalization right so uh, anand i want to just say the first things first here that you know we have so much evidence already of the kind of activities pfi has been indulging in the way they are radicalizing the youth the way they are giving arms training the way their whole financial dealings are so murky i mean i think we do should not be losing any time in declaring pfi as a terrorist organization officially it's not that one part this organization and the team anti national activities consistently for so many years and unless and until we steal their offices we freeze their party please hold aspects. your thoughts uh, ladies and gentlemen i have to interrupt this debate and we we'll come back to this been a huge development in mumbai former mumbai police commissioner sanjay pande has been arrested by the enforcement directorate it's breaking right here on the right stand big news coming through ex mumbai top cop sanjay pande after interrogation has been arrested now uh, we are given to understand he's been arrested in the entire nse phone tapping scam sanjay pande had created his own enterprise and he was running an operation where anybody and everybody working in the nsa their phones were being tapped into and this was being done illegally and in this scam despite him going back into getting into politics or coming back into ips service this firm continued to operate in his family members his name now he's been arrested ashish marishi joining us with more details yes ashish so uh, anand he has been arrested he was questioned for uh, by the enforcement director today but my sources in the enforcement director tell me that sanjay pandey was evasive during questioning and that is why he has been arrested under various sections of the prevention of money laundering act now here uh, the findings of the enforcement directorate is that uh, and in fact there is a, you, we already know there is a cbi case as well and only after that the enforcement director registered a pnla case the findings is basically that Uh, during the tenure of Chitra Ramakrishnan and and uh, you know you remember there are other people also who are basically mm. being investigated in the phone tapping scam uh, is named a company which was basically operational at that point in time uh, the company was basically hired for for cyber forensics or you could say uh, you know the it was basically in disguise at, uh, a contract was done basically to look into the the uh, you know the cyber functioning of national stock exchange but ultimately the job that was done was basically of phone tapping uh, there were various instruments that have been found during searches they have been able to find servers where recordings have been made so they you know the enforcement director is in full evidence they have full evidence against sanjay pandey we all know there is a political twist to the story hmm. reason being that sanjay pandey when he came in if you remember if you remember uh, uh, you know uh, Uh, if you remember that Sanjay Pandey, when he became the police commissioner of Mumbai, uh, we, there were various actions that were expected against certain employees of the enforcement directorate and other individuals as well. But then again, uh, you know, since the government is no longer there, Sanjay Pandey got retired, and uh, as we see that Sanjay Pandey, he, the former top cop of. Uh, of uh, hmm. uh, maharashtra he stands arrested as of now by the enforcement ashish directors. what happens next and has sanjay pandey used his abilities of his company beyond the nse has he well, used has he, has he used this even when he was perhaps the top cop of mumbai so you know uh, difficult to say as of now it is still being investigated too early to comment as of now uh, to whether you know the the, uh, the equipment that was used has been utilized Beyond national stock exchange or not, but there is enough evidence to prove that the phone tap, phone tapping was happening inside national stock exchange. 
which is in violation of the Telegraph Act. The Telegraph Act very clearly says that in case of any phone tapping that needs to be done, you need permission from the Ministry of Home Affairs, whether it is internal or it is external. But here, the services and the equipment of a company which was allegedly owned by uh, by uh, Sanjay Pandey, and later when he got back into the IPS, he uh, you know he transferred the assets of that company into the name of his, his family members, and it continued for a very long time. If you see, uh, even during the uh, the remand paper of Chitra Ramakrishnan, it very clearly says that phone tapping has in National Stock Exchange has been has been happening for a very long time. So certainly a big news as big news break as of now because a former top cop of the of Mumbai uh, he has been sent arrested as of now by the enforcement directorate. Right. Thank you for your inputs, Ashish Marishi. Big development this. Former Mumbai top cop arrested by the Enforcement Directorate for being evasive in his answers in the entire phone tapping matter. This is the big development that has happened. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back to our debate and focus here on the right stand. We broke away for this big news break. Now, coming back into the debate, Arthi Agarwal was making a point against the PFI uh, as we are unearthing and a fresh page or a fresh chapter in the PFI files in their pan-India uh, Islamist design as is being uh, 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 alleged and more importantly, what is it that they were up to up in Bihar? Yes, Arti. Thank you for your patience to our guests. Now go back, uh, going back to the debate. Yes, Arti, please make your point. Uh, so, thank you, Anand. So, I was basically saying that, you know, firstly, we need to officially declare PFI as a terrorist organization hmm. and we need to seal their offices and freeze their financial assets. And let the investigation continue after that. You know, the findings can come out. But my concern is for the lives of innocent people and the threat to Rupa Sharma, which is so so clear right now. And, you know, the threat to people who have somewhere spoken or lent support to Rupa Sharma. Because as we can see, I mean, we don't know what else is there. We can see they have addresses of people. We can see what they're capable of in the past. Mm -hmm. We have seen people from PFI already doing very, uh, you know, uh, brutal acts in the past against uh, people people who have uh, been perceived as, you know, insulting their religion. Mm. So, because of all these things, my concern is mainly for the common citizens and the innocent lives of people. You know, we've, we've seen a very murky track record of CSI and all its associated organizations and I, I don't understand what is stopping us from declaring them as a terrorist where, organization, where the which they have proven themselves to be where, many what, times. What, what happens is that the PFI was in the past uh, Simi. Simi became Indian Mujahideen. Indian Mujahideen then metamorphed into PFI. So you can ban organizations. Yes. What do you do with the members? And uh, Tosif is a lawyer right now and he understands legalese. He will know that you banning an organization is one aspect. Going ahead and uh, uh, nabbing and banning individuals and members, then it becomes individual cases and it becomes a huge legal challenge to be able to do that. Tosif agree, disagree. But whatever is happening around in Bihar should also concern everybody. No, Anand, uh, considering the track record of the present regime in Delhi, uh, hmm. if the Home Minister today decides to protect anyone, he can give protection. We have seen that in case of Nupur Sharma, now that Nupur, Nupur Sharma has secured a uh, no arrest order from the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, uh, we have seen if the uh, Home Minister wants to take action against any particular uh, organization or individual, he is very well capable of doing that. We have seen that even in the past. So the, the question really is, if PFI is a mm. villain, why government is not acting against it? And I have a very simple answer to that. Mm. Because PF, the existence of PFI mm. helps BJP. It saves BJP when the when the government is facing tough time like today hmm. when dollar is at all time high 80 rupees when uh, curd and milk and uh, other essential commodities are being taxed for the hmm. first time 5% gst hmm. so the question in or the, the the government in order to you know uh, avoid these questions help the government hmm. if we are we, if we if we are engaged in you know discussing about uh, uh, pfi and their uh, mischievous, uh, uh, you know, ways of functioning and all that, as is a very simple uh, logical conclusion to the PFI story and the way it has been dealing. And government has, in fact, the, the mm. lawyer of the government to the court had said that they are in the process of banning. Mm. Though I, I really, I mean, some some people may wonder why the government has not banned 
or has not taken action against PFI, hmm. I have the answer because it is it is BJP's saviour. Well, in, in, the, in, in the two and a half minutes of uninterrupted uh, your remarks, sir, you have flirted with contempt of court, you have flirted with questioning the integrity of the judges rather than questioning the comment or the uh, this way, you have actually flirted with the integrity of the judges. You have also used misinformation because the decision to raise GST or include these products under GST and as to add for the slabs was taken collectively by the GST council that includes the finance minister of every single state and union territory and uh, it is done in uh, uh, cohesion together. And that means it's not the women fancy of the finance minister or one individual person again. So that is misinformation. And the fact that you have turned around no, and you're said missing the no, point. no, and they turned around and said that the activity of the PFI benefits the uh, PFI remaining active benefits the BJP. The fact of yes. the matter is that more RSS workers have been RSS and BJP workers have been killed by the workers of this one particular organization than anybody else. So if it was to exact RSS vengeance, also killed them no, no, in no, 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 exact. If it has to be exact vengeance, and you are saying that the that the BJP and its home minister is all powerful, they would have then weeded them out. Abhishek Banerjee. So you have managed to do all of this, sir, in a span of two and a half minutes. So kudos to you for being able to do that. But Abhishek Banerjee. Yeah. So, Anand, uh, the first thing that I would like to say is contradict uh, the other panelists who says that, you know, debate on PFI helps the BJP because from what I can see is the PFI, these issues, they are actually hurting the BJP because it is preventing the government from giving out the correct, rather, the correct information from spreading on issues such as the dollar. Mm. For instance, does the other panelists know that in the last one year, the euro is down 6% against the rupee and the pound is down 7% against the rupee. The difference between 2013 and 2022 is completely clear. In 2013, when Sonia Gandhi was ruling this country, the rupee was falling against all currencies. Whereas in 2022, the rupee is falling only against the dollar. You know, in a class, if one student is failing, if only one student gets zero, then that student has, has some problem. If all the students are failing, it means that the question paper is impossible. So the difference is not difficult to understand. And because of these issues like PFI, I think that the information on issues such as the dollar will be conversion and the economics is not coming out. Same thing on the issue of unemployment. Hmm. Uh, does the other panelists know that in the 2011 census, which was published by Sonia Gandhi's government, set the unemployment in this country at 9.6%. Whereas right now, even by unofficial data, which is beloved by the Liberals, provided by the CMIE, un unemployment in India is only 7.1%. So I would ask the panelists to first take, the other panelists to first take back the shopping fire. No, so from 1.2, yeah. and, and that too, by 2011, the population was estimated to be 1.2 billion. In 2022, the positive population has crossed 1.4 billion. So it's 7% of 1.4 billion, sir. And, and, and it was 9% of 1.2 billion. So, so there are uh, those parametrics, uh, those metrics that will also come in. But we are not debating unemployment right now. We are saying that who are these people who have decided that, that they want to... That is the point. They we want to they, 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 No, sir, we will debate. We will debate unemployment at, at a time and place, at a time and place when it is opportune. But right now, my biggest challenge right now and the story right now is that who are these organizations who have got access to such funds, who have so brazen enough to say that all that I am doing is something which which is, uh, which is perfectly legal and whose members come out repeatedly in repeated states and different different states, Arthi Agarwal. Now look at this, one of the 26 who has been named and accused in the FIR, his name is Sultan Usman Khan, he is a PFI member from Motihari and he has once again put out, he has once again put out, uh, he is the person who is giving them, who is conducting the weapons training in these sector, in these uh, areas, in these training centers and he is the one who is again put out an appeal in the form of donations, give us more money for our activities. So, so this ED's challenge or ED's argument that they are using this entire aspect of donations and they are using cash because anything else is now traceable, everything else is now questionable. So use cash and let's do small amounts and try and give, show it as crowdfunding. Now, Atar Parvez also says money has come from Pakistan, money has come from Bangladesh, money has come from Turkey also in his account. Three people nondescript in a place like Fulwari Sharif have 83 lakh rupees and they claim to have spent 90 lakh rupees already. And we should not be worried. So, so this, these figures are not trivial. 
and you know when we see so many riots and such violent riots erupting for very trivial reasons across the country you know it's not very difficult to put two and two together we are we are looking at we are zeroing in on bihar pfi right now but you know like you said many of these people are history sheeters and this organization itself has its tentacles all over the country we are slowly unraveling uh you know we're investigating and unraveling more and more uh, you know how how deep these roots run but it's very clear that there is illegal illegitimate funding coming into india and supporting anti national activities all across india and they're working in a very orchestrated way this is not some sporadic violence somewhere erupting it is very planned and these type of people working with all these uh, uh, organizations semi and sbpi and pfi all of them are basically just uh, you know different faces different masks put on the same uh, thing group of people essentially hmm. so um, we need to target these individuals also dig up all their history their biometrics uh, you know all their data Hmm. and uh, but i i like i said you know the personal assets uh, uh, the assets right. of these organizations they need to be frozen before 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 they funnel it somewhere else because these people are fully capable of doing that hmm. before they funnel it somewhere else or before they you know pass it around and they are again used to create some other assets somewhere else and then you know again the attention is deflected somewhere else they're literally running around like headless chickens have the time because you know again there is some violence in some part of the country and then the focus goes there hmm. and we are not zeroing in on the root of the problem which is organizations like this which want to make india an islamic islamist state uh, by 2047 hmm. which is what they have very clearly stated in their vision for india you know that Even well, have well that is that is the agenda of these organizations but i have to wind up this debate on one very very heartening note that in this note also purported note that's been found from them they say they need to get at least as the support of 10% muslims across the country they don't have that they don't have that and that is a testament to what we stand for as our nation and how we reject will reject radicalism the government has also come out and put out a statement that it's a very very small minuscule number in terms of base of population which is involved in this but the larger aspect is ladies and gentlemen that 20 crores and 1% of 20 crores or 0.01% of 20 crores is also runs into a few thousands and that is a cause for worry a few uh, a handful are enough to create a huge amount of mayhem and put an entire nation into tizzy and also change the narrative and story for india globally so we don't need even a few thousand we've got to give ensure that they are all weeded out and especially organizations which have an intent like this need to be weeded out faster tosif uh, abhishek and also arti thank you very very much i have got to wind up and we're going to set up debate number 2 or story number 3 tonight on the right stand and we're going to go across the borders go into the united kingdom where history is all set to be written but with it is there a twist in the story as rishi sunak has got his nose ahead yet again ladies and gentlemen four rounds of voting it's down to three people now as one more of the challengers or the aspirants has gotten knocked off in two days it's come down from 5 to 3 so it's not about who is whether rishi sunak is in the fray The question now that's being asked is who is going to challenge Rishi Sunak? And if you see the progression of the numbers and the votes, Rishi Sunak's challenge or Rishi Sunak's rise remains steady, but there are others who are quickly playing catch up. So let's quickly look at the numbers. The race to 10 Downing Street, the fourth round, that's today. It happened just earlier this evening and look at the numbers. You have Rishi Sunak consolidating his lead from yesterday. That was about 115 He has moved three more. He's got three more votes, and it's gone up to 118. But it's Penny Mordaunt who's now climbed up. She's climbed up from the 80s into the 90s. The biggest jump has happened for Liz Truss. Liz Truss had just about 71 votes yesterday after round three, and in round three, and in round four, she's jumped about 15 votes to 86 votes. So she's closing in the gap for number two fight, and these two will breathe down hard here. so it will boil down to two and we'll talk about that in just a bit but kemi badnok she is out the conservative mp she is out with 59 votes she bows out so that's the story right now after four rounds now let's try and look at over as even as he gets more popular there are those who are trying to counter his rise so the offensives have come in by heavyweights sajid javed sarian duncan and also lord adnew 
Both, all three of them have mounted campaigns. He's been attacked over his economic policy as chancellor. Boris Johnson reportedly has supported and endorsed his support for Liz Truss. Daily Mail has become very, very aggressive in its counter campaign. Even the Sunday Telegraph has branded Rishi Sunak as a schoolboy, a liar and untrustworthy all around party gate. It's down to three. It's down to three. Sunak still with his nose ahead is a question that we are asking. Is there a twist in this story or are we all set for history in the making in the race for 10 Downing Street, ladies and gentlemen? Joining us this evening, Sanjay Suri, our own family, CNN News 18, but joining us in London, from London, P.A. Pandit Sati Sharmaji, Chair of the British Board of Dharmic Scholars with us and Nicholas Nugent, Senior Journalist. Namaste. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And uh, there's so much drama. It's it's a half. It's history. What's going to happen, Pandit Satish Sharma ji? Let me ask you. Among the Tories, is Rishi Sunak going to win the vote? Because when it comes down slowly from th now, it's down to three. Then it's going to be who's going to transfer whose votes to whom. Jeshi uh, Dham, and uh, thanks for the chance to speak on this. This uh, story is changing moment by moment, isn't it? But in answer to your question, the first hurdle is for Rishiji to get onto the ticket, the final two. And that rests in the hands of the parliamentarians, the political party there, and it is the most vicious, it is the most um, aggressive, the most cunning, the most devious group of people you can possibly imagine. Inside of parliament, all sorts of deals will be being made. There'll be people thinking, well, if we support Rishi, will we get a job? If we don't support Rishi, will I lose the chance of being a minister? Mm. So the personal dimension is going to have an influence. In addition to that, there are the old voting blocks. Within Parliament, the Tories have, it's sad to say, but the Tories still have a relatively um, racist core. There are still people there who find it very difficult to stomach the idea of a, um, a, a coolie as uh, the Prime Minister of this country. And uh, I think that's something Rishi Ji is going to have to be very wary of. It's easy sometimes to get into a position but if you're not in charge of the framework, then the framework can consume you. And so there is not, it's not all wonderful and um, the, the sun is shining and it will forever shine. There are many, many issues. Mm. The real choice, though, is going to be made when the parliamentarians have had their say, when the final ticket is established, who's on that ticket. Mm. And I will um, stick my sort of head above the parapet. A few weeks ago, when I thought about who would we see on this final ticket, in my mind, it was Rishi Sulukti and Liz Truss. Hmm. in a time when there is a great deal of uncertainty and we have never seen such uncertainty in the united kingdom not for many many decades you need a safe pair of hands hmm. you don't want somebody coming into the ministerial and prime ministerial chair and the, the first roles who has no experience of, of working at that level hmm. so that would automatically suggest liz truss and vishiji would be the choice of the 180,000 members of the Conservative Party. Mm. But there is a really important um, development which uh, I think it would be good not to overlook. For the first okay. time, mm. we now have the chance of a, a candidate and in fact a Prime Minister who will definitely not be pale, male and stale, as they say. <laughs> so this is history in the making. This could be the Obama moment for the Conservatives where a ceiling is broken. For that reason alone, I think the Hindu community and the Indian community here in the United Kingdom are rooting for Rishiji. Mm. Well, who's Britain going to root for? And are they going to shake off these ethnic aspects? So, Nicholas, uh, where's your thought? What, uh, what's going to happen? Because Liz Truss has already played the ethnic ethnicity card. Does Rishi Sunak have a story strong enough to actually win the support that he needs? And of course, Liz Truss playing catch up with Penny. So what do you see happening in the next round? Sanjay Suri coming to you after this. I wish I could predict. It really gets more exciting by the day. Um, certainly, Rishi Sunak is in with a good chance. Mm. But uh, look at the arithmetic. Uh, one more candidate needs to go out tomorrow. Mm. And when that happens, the votes for that candidate get transferred. And it could easily give the, uh, the, the, the final two. The numbers could look rather different. Mm. And as your previous speaker said, then it goes to the country at large. Um, for them to judge, not the country at large, but the conservative membership at large. So members up and down the country mm. and they have the final say. Now, until now, members of parliament have been voting. And if I may be a little bit cynical about their motives, 
they mm. have been voting for who is most likely to get the Conservatives back in at the next election. Mm. In other words, they don't want to lose their seats. Mm. And that's a lot of what it's about. Once it goes to the country, yes, uh, electing the Conservatives back into power in two years' time or so, that's an important part of it. Mm. But I think the ordinary members will judge according to different things. Mm. Um, as your previous so, speaker said, hmm. it could raise the race card, hmm. but I rather doubt it myself. I hmm. think the fact that Rishi Sunak is in Parliament already representing a, a fairly rural constituency shows that he's already, if you like to use the term, accepted as a good British citizen, hmm. uh, which is really the only thing that matters here. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know. I'm pretty sure that Rishi will be one of the two candidates put to the mm. party at large. And we're waiting to see which of the two ladies will uh, be on the on the ballot for the uh, for the next round, the next round that will take so, a month or more. Mm, so we'll true. have quite some time to wait before we know whether Britain has its first Indian origin prime minister, if you want to put it like that. Yeah, but where he is a British citizen, but the point is that the aspect of ethnicity does come in. It shouldn't come in, like you said. But let's turn this question around and ask Sanjay, my friend. Sanjay, who are who's the Labour rooting for? Who are the Labour Party members rooting for? So then you know who they are their prospects against two years down the line. Well, certainly Labour would fear Rishi Sunak more than others. Um, the question now, of course, uh, is what the Tories do, the MPs uh, in the first instance and the Tory membership uh, in the follow-up uh, mm. to this round of the voting. Before we quite get to the race card, I think we are up here against the Boris Johnson card. Mm. Boris Johnson has clearly taken a view that he wants to oppose Rishi Sunak, that it should be anyone but Sunak, clearly. There is a hidden Boris campaign. Of course, uh, we could uh, um, very readily believe that anyone um, uh, Boris Johnson supports would have received uh, the kiss of death. But clearly, some of the campaigning that we are seeing in the media and some in the social media as well, a bit of uh, a racist overtone, to put it mildly, hmm. um, if not in so many words, but effectively to counter uh, Rishi and prop up a Liz Trust primarily. Uh, this is going to be one hell of a night for campaigning and for whispering campaigning. Hmm. Clearly, there's going to be a very strong move now to stop Rishi. Uh, very, very unlikely that he can be stopped from being in the final, though hmm. theoretically that is possible. True, theoretically, because, theoretically, because, because the split of votes from Penny... Flag. Yeah, because is how many votes is Liz able to steal from those who are who are rooting for Penny, and how many votes is uh, you know uh, Rishi Sunak able to try and woo from those who are let's say who are voting for Penny, just in a scenario where you are seeing a Rishi Sunak versus Liz Truss, because right now Penny and uh, Liz Truss they are getting closer. It's a big jump that Liz Truss has 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 made between round three and round four. Sanjay. So, well, um, for, for Rishi Sunak to be stopped from being one of the two finalists, uh, a couple of things would have to happen. One, that all the 59 uh, votes, or at least the 59 votes uh, released by Kemi uh, Banadok, uh, would go to the other candidates and not to Sunak at all. Hmm. And secondly, that some who have voted for Sunak uh, decide not to vote for him. And neither of those scenarios appears likely. He is very, very close to the finishing line, a one or two votes and he's done. He hmm. reaches that figure of 120. It really is between the other two. But the fact is that in this last round, Sunak gained only three votes of yes. the 31 that were released. Um, it represents a slackening of momentum that we were not expecting. Hmm. So, or, or is that, like, let me let me take it easy in round four and I'll go the whole hog in round five and then try and play catch up Pandit Satish Sharma. How do you see this panning out? Because he needs two or three votes to get to that safe number of 120, as Sanjay Suri says. But then uh, Liz Truss will be aggressively running because she's got six votes to try and catch up and uh, try and get more than uh, go ahead of Penny. I think uh, your previous call is remark about Kemi's votes. 
That's very important and very significant. Kemi obviously appealed to a particular demographic and a particular constituency. And that constituency is very much more aligned to Rishuji. And I'm not talking about race, I'm not talking about tribalism either. Hmm. Rishuji and Kemi have worked together. They have worked together in very high uh, office in the hmm. Treasury, ministerial posts. So they hmm. have a track record of working together. And I can even see a scenario where if Rishiji is successful as Prime Minister, he would be thinking about who am I going to put together in my team. Mm. I'm sure Kemi would be also thinking, yes. wouldn't it be wonderful for Britain to have an Indian origin Hindu Prime Minister and an African origin uh, woman uh, Deputy Prime Minister. So mm. many of these calculations will be being done. And I, I think that will, th these are the factors that will ensure Rishiji gets onto that final ticket. Mm. And then he has a month. He has a month and a half at the most within which to manage and handle the actual constituency who are going to vote for him, the membership. Okay. And I think in that month and a half, he's got a really good story to tell. His story is exactly what the Conservatives have, all, have always touted. Um, from a very humble beginnings in a poor part of Southampton, okay. average class, working class, middle class parents, aspirational, success story when he joined mm. the Infosys family. Infosys were not a massive global entity. The shares were not worth what they are worth at this moment in time. And in that time since then, he has now become a success. Who yes. would want who would want a prime minister who was on the verge of bankruptcy, right. who was financially irresponsible? So I think the story he will be able to tell will get him the votes in the constituencies as well. Well, is he going to say the right story for Britain? That's what that's that's what's important. He may have a great story going, but does he have a great story or a great script ready for Britain? That's going to be perhaps the most important aspect where he's got to come, you know, convince the conservatives, if I may say that. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Always a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, we're going to continue this conversation and track Rishi Sunak's rise here on the right stand and on CNN News 18. For the moment, taking a very short break. When we are back, it's the real report. Stay with us.